Hi, everyone. I'm Rabbi Katie Allen. I am the co-founder of the Jewish Climate Action Network, which is the sponsor of this evening event. And I am just delighted that you all are here with us. Um, we did have a lot of people sign up and hopefully some of them will dribble in in the in the coming moments. But regardless of whether that happens or not, we are here to um, enjoy this evening's presentation with Rabbi Malka uh, Bina Klein, who is I will introduce in a few moments. But I just would like um, to have us all introduce ourselves first. We're going to, uh, whether we're a small group or a bigger group, as we go along, it doesn't matter. Uh, just to say what your name is and where you live. And we'll just add, we'll sort of set the stage for gratitude here and just invite everybody to say something about the natural world that you're feeling grateful for as we start our program this evening. So um, um, I don't know, Thea, you want to go first? Oh, sure. My name is Thea Ibral. I uh, work with JCAN and I live in Dedham, Massachusetts. And um what else am I supposed to say? My um, nature that you're feeling grateful for. I am loving the weather that we have currently. Uh, it's been beautiful. I've been walking out in it. So, yeah, thank you. Very grateful. Okay. So, whoever wants to go next, just jump in. I'll jump in. I'm um, Malka Bina, live in Philadelphia. And um, we have the sunset happening right now right out our window and there's these stripes of like a luminescent light orange and multiple shades of blue light blue um so we're, we're right in the presence of magnificence sounds good okay and and judith black from marblehead is saying that you have no voice do you still have no voice huh i was hoping you'd have it back by tonight deeply grateful for the soil that keeps honoring us with tomatoes. Oh, yes. I could vote for tomatoes. I guess I didn't say what I was feeling grateful for when I'm asking everybody else to do so, but I'll I'll get I'll get it at the end. Okay. Who'd like to go next? I'll go. Hi. Um I just spent 2 hours in uh doing garden transplanting and I'm grateful for the for the innate energy that plants have to uh, rejuvenate themselves, to um, overwinter when they can, to and when I think a a plant is gone and somehow it it revives, mm -hmm. I'm always amazed. So that amazing resilience, mm -hmm. of plants. Yes. Okay. And your name and where you're where you're. Oh, my name is Sari Krieger, a uh, Rabbi Sari Krieger, and I live in Westboro, Massachusetts. Thank you, thank you. And who'd like to go next? I'm Susan Klein. I live in Washington, DC. And uh, a couple of hours ago, I looked up at the sky and I saw such unusual clouds. And that's what I'd like to talk about in the natural world. Okay, thank you. Yeah, everything that we see in the cloud, in the sky, the amazing clouds, Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Gabriel. Um, I'm from I'm from Stoneham, Massachusetts, and um, I'm just grateful for. Um, you mentioned the resilience of plants. I'm grateful for the re resilience of all of all the species, and you know, it just gives me some hope that some of them are coming are coming back, and I hope that more can. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe, and welcome. I'll go, oh, Deborah. Deborah. Okay. Thanks, Deborah. New Bedford down on the south coast. We've had uh, challenging weather this summer. Very wet sometimes, very hot sometimes, but uh, we have uh, uh, formulated uh, a way of uh, living in some kind of uh, harmony with it. The, uh, the, the, the water drains into the sea. We have a beautiful harbor walk and uh, cove walk that uh, allow everyone freely to um, to uh, to see and take part um, in in our, in our seascape and uh, mm. thankful for that. 
Ah, the beauty of the seascape. Thank you. My name is Sarah Bina. I'm calling from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And something and, you're grateful for in nature. Well, I'm sitting right here looking out my window at these gorgeous, lush, tall trees mm. in my home. As some people might know, I have about 30 or 40 different plants. <laughs> and yesterday was my birthday. And I have more flowers of different kinds than you could possibly imagine. Oh, so you are surrounded by nature. That sounds great. Okay. Um, Matt, would you and, like to go next? And I want to know how old you are, Sarah. <laughs> I was 88 yesterday. Oh, oh, happy birthday. Yeah, happy know. birthday. Hey, I'm Matt Lee. I'm from Matt. Massachusetts. Okay. Can that helped us plant a... Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. I am grateful for a grant from Japan that helped us plant a pollinator garden at Congregation of Beth Elohim. We're restoring a little uh, parking island that uh, had a lot of pine trees that were shading our solar panels, our solar panels to be. Now they're a reality. And so we've been growing a lot of uh, plants and uh, pollinator plants, and I've been gradually planting trees and shrubs, and it's uh, looking pretty good. People are saying that they enjoy the, the wildflowers there. Oh, so they're blooming. That's great. That's wonderful. That's so neat to hear. Terrific. Okay, let's see. Scott Lewis, Pembroke Pines, Florida. I'm calling from Temple Solel uh, in Hollywood, actually, but I missed what you asked about the natural world. Something you're grateful for. Oh, grateful for. Right. Um, well, many things, actually, but I, I love the ocean down in South Florida. So uh, it's always grateful for that and, and our beautiful clear water and, and uh, beautiful coral reefs here. Mm. Wow. We have just created a beautiful mosaic of nature. It's beautiful. And I have to say that those tomatoes are sticking in my mind. And in terms of seeing something I'm feeling grateful for, so I'm going to add my tomatoes to that list. Um, so we just have this beautiful smorgasbord of what we of, of the natural world, and um, so I I feel like I can kind of see some of it be in front of me. So that's so. Thank you, everyone, for all that you just added to that. So um, so <laughs> the first thing that we're going to do is um, we're going to have a short. Well, Judith Black was going to give us a report from the climate march in in. Um, in uh, New York uh, this, pa this past Sunday, and uh, she was going to tell us, which would have been so cool, but she has no voice. Um, okay, I will say, she said, as we poured into central New York City from many corners of this nation, the rainbow of ages, languages, skin colors, and affinity groups was a powerfully uplifting experience. The art, large and small, that represented our demands to the Biden administration brought a poetry to an action. The many children and families brought home the literary, the literally of this fight. We are here for nothing less than to man to demand a future. One person could not take in the length and depth of this seventy-five thousand person process pr procession. I kept jogging up and down the sidewalk looking for the faith contingent, but that was a fool's errand. We were all there because we still have a faith that our government can take concerted effort to preserve a livable planet. And I think that's the major part of um, of her experience there. And um, uh, she has yeah. many opinions about what happened, but we'll... <laughs> We'll just we'll just cut to the description and leave it at that. So thank yeah. you, thank you. I know there are some pictures of the JCAN banner there, and uh, I know some people were praying with their feet, and very grateful for that. So um, and and very appropriately way to do if you are, you know, uh, as we're celebrating the birthday of the world, like may it continue to be reborn. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, and so it's now my. Um, my my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce Malka Bina, who I have only just recently had the pleasure of getting to know because um, she volunteered to write an Earth Etude for Elul, one of those little, if you've been following the JCAN blog, one of those 
little pieces that um, connect something about the natural world and Chuba. And she did a very beautiful piece, piece about flowers. So that, when I saw that, I was like, this is a special person. And then I looked at her website and I saw that she was doing really cool things with sackcloth and Yom Kippur and uh, a delightful um, little chapbook story of the story of Jonah. And I was like, I got to get to know this woman a little bit better. And so we we had some conversations and uh, the next thing we knew, we were planning this event tonight. So so she does all kinds of wonderful things in the community there in um, Philadelphia and uh, bringing together people for, for meaningful ways of, of exploring Judaism. And so that tonight is part of that, but she's bringing it beyond Philadelphia to all of us here. So I'm just very happy that all of you are here. And I think this is going to be a very interesting a little evening that's going to enrich our um are thinking about Yom Kippur as we go into the, hol the holiest day of the calendar. So Malkabina, Rabbi Malkabina Klein, take 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 it over. It's it's all yours. Mm. Thank you so much, Katie and Thea, for welcoming me. And um, before I start with my presentation, want to invite all of us to, if you're so moved, to place your hands on your heart. And just allow your breath to soften. Notice what you're feeling in this moment. We're just a few days to Yom Kippur. Honoring whatever feelings are present support our being fully present. And noticing, is there anything I'm still processing, thinking about from my day and blessing those things and saying to them, I will come back to you after this time. I'm here entering sacred time. And I'm truly honored that each of you are here to join me on this journey of exploring ways to um, deepen our work on the climate crisis through Yom Kippur ritual. And we start with a chant. <laughs> Awaken, arise to the wholeness of your being. Awaken, arise to the beauty of your soul. Awaken, arise to the wholeness of your being. Awaken, arise to the beauty of your soul. Hit orary, hit orary, kiva orech, kumi ori. Hit orary, hit orary, kiva orech, kumi ori. Awaken, arise to the wholeness of your being. 
Awaken, arise to the beauty of your soul. Awaken, arise to the wholeness of your being. Awaken, arise to the beauty of your soul. Hita rari, hita rari, kiva orech, kumi ori. Hita rari, hita rari, kiva orech, kumi ori. Awaken, arise to the wholeness of your being. Awaken, arise to the beauty of your soul. One thing I have learned over the years as I face the climate crisis and dip my toe into activism in different forms, different campaigns, different, in, with something so enormous is the importance of nurturing the spirit and always coming back to my love for life and my love for beauty and and the the importance of nurturing the soul and not getting like dragged down in the darkness while at the same time honoring the pain um, but the the gratitude and the love must come first and this is this is an ongoing learning journey for me and so i want to um start with um just giving a little bit of a background about the the the, the work i do which is um I'm drawn to the art of ritual of of um, ritual helps us enter into um, sacred time, sacred moments and, and, and creates containers to hold that which is um, that kind of needs without a container, it kind of um, swirls around and just helps us to to come back to to grounding and to move energy to to find our tears to find our courage to find our power and um i'm really interested in mining our tradition for um what are rituals that are already have have come from ancient times and how can we renew them revive them and create something new and so um i I want to start with just acknowledging that um, for those of us who are shul synagogue goers, we're familiar with either this prayer book or a different one. This is this happens to be the Reconstructionist Machs or Kohen Shema that we, and it's quite heavy. Just for the two days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we have this book that's so filled with the language of our ancestors and also contemporary poetry, and. I was drawn, um, I think this was, I started this project back in 2018, I believe, um, to writing a, um, taking the communal confessional, the al Khait, and um, asking how can we um, really touch right into the climate crisis with the al Khait. And it's very, very powerful. Um, and I encourage, if you haven't recently looked at at, at this liturgy to that what's already there is very, very powerful. And so I drew from some of the and especially the introduction to it. Um, and then um, uh, um, and I'm going to show it to you in a moment that that different pieces of owning what we have done wrong. And and in American culture, this is something that I find is really missing that we do not have a like our our leadership um the our government does not say we have done wrong generally and that is that causes and and leadership of 
big corporations generally don't say we have done wrong. And there's there's a lot of untruth and a lot of greed and a lot of danger comes from not naming this is what is out of balance. Because when we name what's out of balance, then we can start to correct it. And so um, I like one of my fantasies is that this prayer would be something that's recited regularly in the halls of power, in corporations, in the government. And, um, and given that that has not yet happened and we don't know when that is going to happen, um, we start with ourselves and that we are changing consciousness through naming the the truths that we know in our being. And um, I want to uh, just share a little story. This is um, not about climate change per se, but about environmental degradation. When I, um, I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which became popular this summer because of the movie Oppenheimer. And uh, when I, I worked at the laboratory one summer, um, when I was in college and I got this idea, oh, it would be fun to have a dialogue with the director of the laboratory. And I called up his office and they said, come for lunch and bring 10 friends. So we went and had a conversation with the director at the time. And I asked what I thought was a, um, just a question that was on my heart, which was, how do you deal with the, the ethical implications of the damage, the environmental degradation to, the, to Nevada through all of the nuclear testing? Um, and this was a time when they were not actually doing nuclear testing. They, were, they, they somehow figured out a way to do non-nuclear nuclear testing. Um, and, but he said, and so, so there were two things that happened in the room. One was, it seemed like my friends from high school were wanting to crawl under the table because I was embarrassing, because I was speaking into a taboo in our town. You don't ask those kinds of questions. And secondly, the director, without missing a beat, said, there is no evidence of environmental degradation. And, and he spoke with such confidence. And the thing that I've been processing lately is, I knew that he was not telling the truth, but why didn't I say anything more? And, and I think this is something that we, I imagine we all have our times when like we know something to be true, but, but it just not, where was the, the courage to, to, to speak in, into that moment? And, um, and so that's really part of what these prayers are about is practicing the courage of speaking the truth that we know are are important for saving life on this planet. So I'm going to pull up the al -Khait. Can you all see that? Is that good? Um, so um, this first paragraph is my personal theology of how I understand God at this time in my life. Holy one of blessing, you are the eternal, the mystery, and the beyond. You are the present and the here and now. So God transcendent and imminent. You are the web of life. You are love. And so the prayer begins with um, making a connection with the divine. This next piece comes from the tradition. You recognize the wrongs we do, both purposeful and unintentional the ones we choose and the ones we are compelled to do, the revealed and the hidden. In your presence, all is revealed and known. And I find 
these words very helpful in processing how I relate to my impact on the climate, that the wrongs we do, the ones we choose and the ones we are compelled to do. And um, yes, I could choose not to drive a car anymore, but then I wouldn't be able to go the places I want to go. So there's a little bit of it, or, and there's not other ways to get, a, I mean, there's, so there's this piece of, um, like it, that, that being torn all the time, or, or yes, I could not use heat in my home, but then I'd be very cold. So, um, so the purposeful and the unintentional, the ones we choose and the ones we are compelled to do, the revealed and the hidden. In your presence, all is revealed and known. And just invite you to notice what does it the, feel like to kind of acknowledge that and to imagine that there is a, a source of love out there that that knows all of the complexities. May it be your will, beloved one, to grant forgiveness for all of our sins, to be merciful for all of our injustices. And let us atone for all we have done wrong. And that's the traditional introduction to this prayer known as the Al Chait. Al Chait Shechatanu Lefanecha. And which I translate um, poetically as we take communal responsibility for the wrongs that we have done. And there's also a custom to tap on our chest when we recite each of these. And um, I want to just unpack that for a moment. Um, I don't think that th this is, I don't think that we're meant to like hit ourselves. Like that we're not like kind of whacking ourselves. I think that this is like a gentle wake up tap. And I learned in my um, studies of Qigong, um, if anyone doesn't know what Qigong is, it's um, healing exercises from Chinese tradition. Um, but I learned that the thymus gland is here under the breastbone. And this, this tapping helps to stimulate our immune system in the physical body. So um, in my imagination that we're also stimulating our spiritual immune system by tapping here. And but I but I also want to acknowledge that um, there and I, I have I have worked with this over the years on Yom Kippur that we can also simply place a hand on the heart. Really noticing what does my heart need? Does my heart need some tapping or does my heart just need loving presence in this moment? Um, but our, our heart is the center of our compassion. Um, just so important to to honor. As we, as we name what we have done wrong. So here's, um, here's what came to me. This first one comes from a teaching from, from the um, Vietnamese teacher of mindfulness and activist Thich Nhat Hanh, who was asked, what do we need to do to save the world? What is most needed? And he said, to hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. So we recite for the wrong we have done before you by failing to hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. For the wrong we have done before you through our short sightedness. For the wrong we have done before you by allowing our sense of overwhelm to numb us into inaction. For the wrong we have done before you by forgetting how much we love life. For the wrong we have done before you by poisoning the air we breathe and the water we drink. 
for the wrong we have done before you by failing to mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions. For the wrong we have done before you through environmental racism, often locating toxic power plants and other sources of pollution in the neighborhoods where the majority of residents are people of color. And this particular one is very poignant to me. I was at a training on environmental racism and heard a young activist name that we would not be in the global disaster we are in if we were committed to treating every person with dignity. And that this idea that certain neighborhoods are disposable has gotten us, has spun out into the, the crisis worldwide. For the wrong we have done before you by empowering political leaders and company executives who focus on building power and wealth rather than protecting the common good. For the wrong we have done before you by granting climate deniers a platform for shaping public opinion in the United States. For the wrong we have done before you by failing to take responsibility for our country's oversized contribution to destabilizing the climate. For the wrong we have done before you by industrialized farming practices that both mistreat animals and contribute to warming the planet. For the wrong we have done before you by destroying food supplies and habitats for countless species of animals. For the wrong we have done before you by stripping and burning the Amazon. For the wrong we have done before you by carrying on with business as usual as we stand at the brink of human created climate catastrophe. And the invitation to just notice how you're feeling. And also, is there any other wrong that's arising for you? It feels important to name in this moment. And if there is, feel free to unmute and to say in the form for the wrong we have done before you by. For the wrong we have done before you by not honoring the truth. For the wrong we have done before you, I'm not speaking in a way that people can hear our truth and make the most effective shift and change. For the wrong we have done before you by blaming and shaming instead of offering positivity toward shift. Judith says, for the wrongs we have done before by the hubris of believing my approach to this work is superior to others. And I add, for the wrong we have done for killing 10,000 species a year. For the wrong we have done by following the system we're using weapons of war and killing is an interaction with the earth and species and plants is the norm and by not allowing nurturing 
positive relationship between human and other species, land, earth, and soil to exist. For the wrong we have done before you by not creating climate sustaining policy and by not signing on to international treaties. For the wrong we have done before you by leaving our children to deal with this mess. For all of these wrongs, beloved one who forgives, please forgive us, pardon us, help us atone. They all Kulam Elo Asalichot Salahlan Lechalan Kaperlanu. And this next piece, which is from the traditional text, I find so moving. Do not forsake us, do not cast us away, you who brought us into being, and do not cause us the destruction that our wrongs demand. Do not forsake us, do not cast us away, you who brought us into being, and do not cause us the destruction that our wrongs demand. And you may notice that there is a mosaic right behind me. This mosaic, uh, it's a little hard to see, um, it's an image um, of, this is by Rabbi Gila Ruskin, of, there's a, a midrash, a legend about the various angels who are arguing about whether to allow for human beings to be created. And um, because there was an awareness that human beings had potential for great destruction. And so ultimately, the angel of truth was hurled out of heaven in order to allow God to go ahead and create humans. Um, and what this, this mosaic is about is if you know Hebrew, there, these, these tiles have the word emet, aleph, mem, taf on them. There's um, the next uh, stage of this midrash is that truth sprouts from the earth, which is a line from the Psalms, emet me eretz titzmach. And so the idea that, um, yes, um, there was an, an awareness from the very beginning that humans had this potential and the, the way forward is for us to connect with truth. And then my prayer closes. May we live ever more gently on this beautiful blue green planet that we call home. May we care for all who are displaced by the changing climate. May we transform our ways so that future generations may live in peace and prosperity. And I welcome if anyone has a just a, a reflection or a question. And also, I just want to acknowledge that if anyone has, if there's a line that feels really compelling that it, it needs to be in there, um, you know, be in touch and we can, you can send it to me. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so, so now that you've had a chance to experience, just imagine if, um, like this were part of like for our own consciousness raising and healing to, to make this part of a daily practice 
or a or to say it um, uh, you know, have have a. There's a. Um, are you familiar with Yom Kippur Katan? Um, oh yes. And Judah said, "Who is sharing my?" Oh, this is my wife Nisa. Who? Um, will you say hello? Hi. <laughs> I am Nisa. Um, and I, I guess it, my gratitude for nature is the all the green. I couldn't. I don't think I could leave the East Coast because I love all the trees and the green trees. Um, Thank you, Judith. When I had asked Nisa if she wanted to introduce herself earlier, and she said no. So I was shy. Sorry. <laughs> um, Asuri has her hand up. So sometimes I refer to myself as a heretical rabbi because there are certain ways of addressing God that um, that no longer resonate for me. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to figure out how. I could use these same very powerful prompts um, without addressing it to God. And I, I think for me, it would be for the wrong we've done to ourselves by instead of for the wrong we've done to you, God. Mm. <clears throat> I think I'd have to have to do it like that. And, mm. and just I really appreciated your story about Los Alamos, but and I'm wondering if you had this opportunity again, what would you say to this corporate CEO? Yeah, I mean, it, so it's a, and he's, he's not just a corporate CEO, he works for the government. Um, and um, so actually, and it turns out that I'm, I'm just making plans to go back home um, in a few weeks and friends of the family told me that he's living near them, this very same, former director and mm -hmm. maybe able to arrange a meeting for me. So I may actually have a chance. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, but what I'm, thank you for that question, Suri. And, and thank you also for the, the piece about um, like, how do we work with the God language and this very, very rich that pieces you're raising. Um, so if I bring myself back to my 19 year old self, I immediately get, just so tight. So, so like that, my 19 year old self is not equipped to talk to him. Um, but if I kind of then imagine my aligned self, um, I would say, um, let's look at, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's even with my aligned self, it feels terrifying. It's a, um, although I, I just spoke to a, a high school friend the other day who said to me, and, and um, she just wrote a very powerful novel, and she said, anything worth doing, like that generally things worth doing are terrifying. Um, but I think I would say to him, radioactive material being is, is dangerous to life and we know that and let's look at the research and um, I think that you are um, like I, I'm not sure whether you're God it feels so hard because because there's like you know I mean I'm a, you know when who who is who are actually telling lies and who are in denial inside or need to have kind of be disassociated in order to do the work they do and like a, a little story about um lying uh that, that you may or may not know is that um during the kennedy administration um the the americans were aware for many years that israel was developing nuclear weapons because they got a, a plutonium reactor from france that and there someone took photos of it and they saw that it was the very same footprint as the one in France. But Israel denied that they were doing anything weapons wise. Um, and so some American inspectors were sent over. So the Israelis actually built a brick wall apparently over the control panel of this plutonium reactor and built a whole fake control panel room so that, um, and Ben-Gurion said, we are not working on weapons. 
and into like, but it was just like the nature of the nature of this work of is um, to not speak the truth. And and I think the same thing for I mean the that oil companies knew about hum, the 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 fossil fuels and and they just didn't report the research. I mean it's because their livelihoods were um, so. Um, but I I'm I mean I and thank you for that. So so we're actually going to get we're going to get to Jonah in a few minutes and we'll come back to that question and I'm going to invite all of us to. Um, think about the question of so so um, I'll, I'll give you a preview Jonah who we read at the end of Yom Kippur we are um, he is asked to go to Nineveh and to um, tell the Ninevites to repent and and his line to them is 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed that's his line. He repeats over and over again. And the Ninevites actually repent. And so my challenge for each of us is what is your one line that you want to be repeating over and over? Your prophecy. What is your particular message? Um, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. But before we do that, um, any final comments or reflections on the al -Khait? Um, so, so the next piece I wanted to share is um, sackcloth. So, um, I um, I have a, a write up about this on my website, which I think was in the the advertisement for this program. Um, I started noticing that sackcloth is mentioned many times in the Jewish Bible, in Torah. And, um, but we don't have it as part of our Jewish ritual in our day. And I started Googling, I actually discovered that you can get like a sackcloth prayer blanket that some Christian communities like make sackcloth shirts or sackcloth prayer blankets that you sit on. But that's not ever been part of the Judaism I have known. And I have been promoting sackcloth in recent years. And just in experimenting with it. And um, I believe that the ancient sackcloth was made out of goat hair. Um, and but what I know about it is it's uncomfortable. It's like, and and that sackcloth was worn at times of mourning and at times of repentance. So for example, um, when um, when Mordechai finds out in the book of Esther, our Purim story, when Mordechai finds out that um, that the Jewish people are are in grave danger of being killed by Haman's decree, he it says he puts on sackcloth and and, and ashes, and um, and even in there's even a Yom Kippur reference in there, or the Haftarah that we read on Yom Kippur, the passage from Isaiah speaks about uh, it, it critiques. Is this the fast I desire? And it also says, and putting on your sackcloth. So there's a suggestion that people put on sackcloth as a way to repent. But in Isaiah, it's a critique of you're doing an empty ritual. But it seems like the ritual is very important to them. So um, I um, have been experimenting with this, and and I. Um, developed a relationship with the owner of a local coffee shop who um, has provided me with some sackcloths. So um, this is a, a sackcloth dress that I made for myself. Um, actually, I can put it on. So it's uncomfortable. And, and if, if one walked around in a sackcloth dress, like there is no business as usual. So like, imagine if if we like, you know, once a month. So oh, I was starting to mention the day before the new month is called Yom Kippur Katan, the little Yom Kippur. What if once a month we started a movement that all of us wore sackcloth dresses? Um, 
But I have to say that I, I gave a presentation about this at my, my rabbinical association, and um, they, I put on my sackcloth dress. I, I, had, I gave a five-minute presentation as part of a panel on climate change. But I was decided I was going to keep the dress on, but it was actually wrong to keep it on because I was this was like the first time I was in person after COVID. And like it just felt wrong to be happily greeting colleagues and friends while wearing this. So it's it's actually like it's it's a um I think one needs to be in ritual space. But but another like fantasy I have is that um, you know, we to sit in front of a governmental office, a group of people wearing sackcloth dresses. So that's that's one piece is is kind of um, going for the the discomfort, and and it's also one could potentially wear sackcloth for Yom Kippur. Um, but a a second way that's not as extreme is like thinking about like the ribbons for example for aids awareness um is to make a little piece of sackcloth and a safety pin and to pin it to the clothing and so it becomes a conversation piece and you know i carry around a um, you know sometimes when i'm up for doing this a, you know a little box of the of pins and sackcloth and so if someone asks then I can offer them a piece as well um, and it's just like for me it's close to my heart a reminder that things are not right so it's a sign of mourning and it's also a sign of we need to be turning doing tshuva um, so I but I do need to acknowledge that Anissa is here too um, and she often does our laundry, is that I, I once accidentally left my, my sackcloth pin on my shirt and it like kind you of- turned your shirt inside out. <laughs> oh, and it, and it just it. kind of disintegrates and makes a mess of the laundry. So it's not a, <laughs> um, you know, so, but, but we're experimenting. I also have a friend who um, kind of like put a kind of, um, can't remember what it's called, a shellac on it. So made it kind of into more of a pin that doesn't, because it kind of, it's kind of falls apart, but that's actually kind of interesting that's falling apart. Um, and I've also made like a shawl. I taught a class at the Havara Institute several years ago um, and, and Tisha B'Av, our national day of mourning in the summertime was, was during that week. And so I gave everybody a sackcloth shawl to wear and, and some ashes and we experimented with that. Um, and then another thing is I, I put it on my backpack so that I'm walking around and have, so it's kind of like a pin that, um, and the, um, so this is something that I, I want to invite you all into considering doing. So sackcloth can be purchased or, or you can find a coffee shop that, that doesn't know what to do with its, its, its sackcloth bags or, um, I also saw that there's clothing makers, there's a kind of sackcloth that, that there's beautiful dresses being made out of or, um, but, but this like reviving this ritual of um, that something we wear that supports our grieving for what we are losing and supports us in remembering that things are, thing, that um, things need to, need to transform and that we need to transform. Um, so any questions or comments on that? Uh, Ellen. I'll just make a suggestion that when we choose to do this, which I think is a really cool idea, that we choose the most sustainable fabric, which in my opinion is locally produced hemp without any pesticides or chemical fertilizers because there is a huge footprint of environmental destruction and climate um, problems with most clothing mm. Mm. and there is starting to be locally produced hemp um, throughout uh, the northeast at least in the i think new york is actually a big stake with it um, and, in Quebec. and Ellen, so and, and you get me thinking that 
I, I, I don't, um, it would be interesting to actually have a, have a piece of clothing made that one would be comfortable wearing out in the world that's made of the locally produced fabric. The, um, yes, um, thank you for raising that. Um, I, I just want to add, a lot of people think that organic cotton is the solution and still even organic cotton is a heavy user of water and other things. So certainly better than, you know, regular cotton, but you know, your your better choices are going to be a, a local hemp, potentially a flax. Thank you, Ellen. Scott. I'm just curious, you you decided that goat hair was not such a great product or or why did you not stick with goat hair? I don't have access to goat hair cloth. Okay. Um, yeah. I, um, and I, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, and I'm, I'm still, so I mean, and I, I really invite you all into this exploration together of, and it's um, like, how do we revive an ancient practice at these times when we so need to be touching into these aspects of our, um, like what we're dealing with in daily, like, how do we, how do we like get out of numbness? And um, the, the, I, and I, I just, I just want to say that um, like create creativity is very important to me. And I noticed that the Hebrew word for creation, the root bet resh aleph, that's the second word of the Torah, bereshit bara, is the same root as health. Like if, if someone sneezes, you say la briut, which to to your health, which is it? So bet Rachel. So health and healing and creativity are um, intimately connected. And so I invite you into if this speaks to you into this creative process. And I I have a um, a, a friend who who then who who put wove um, different colored strands to represent different forms of injustice or different forms of healing into. Her piece of sackcloth. So there's there's much to be explored. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, so we will now transition to Jonah. Um, so I am blessed that um, to have a a long and deep relationship with the prophet Jonah um, because my father chanted Jonah. I grew up in Los Alamos, as I said, and at the we had a small synagogue, the Los Alamos Jewish Center, and my father was the Jonah chanter. Um, and so, um, and he would write a, a, a little talk every year. And so I, Jonah was, was an important part of, of my growing up. So, um, I was inspired when this time of year, probably, um, I can't remember what year this was, maybe six years ago, um, I was inspired to make a zine. I just took pieces of, of white paper and tore, cut them up and folded them and made like a little booklet and started writing. And this is what came through. And I, I made up in that moment sackcloth productions. Um, so the title of this is, so, so we're now in story time, it's, it's almost bedtime, The Reluctant Prophet Who Saved the World. Hi, I'm Jonah. I'm an ordinary guy. My Hebrew name, Yonah, means dove, a bird that symbolizes peace. I don't experience a lot of peace inside of me. I just want to live my life. And God keeps calling me, asking me to do things I don't want to do. So my solution, go to sleep. I love to sleep. When I'm sleeping, as long as the dreams don't come, I can rest and be peaceful. Sleeping is wonderful. I can even sleep through storms. So. God wanted me to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. They're doing a lot of bad stuff there. Why me? What do I have to do with this? I'm tired just thinking about it. 
they won't listen to me anyways. I love to sleep. Well, I tried to run away from God and ended up inside a big fish. I know I drew a smile on the fish, but I don't think the fish was so happy. I certainly wasn't happy inside of there. It was kind of gross being inside the intestines of another creature, and I was seasick all the time. And worst of all, I couldn't sleep. So I finally made a deal with God, who told the fish to spit me up by Nineveh, and I agreed to play the prophet. 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. I called out over and over. I was still smelly from my time inside the big fish, so everyone noticed me. 40 days and Nineveh will be overturned. Well, the Ninevites believed in God and could see that God had sent me and they decided to save their city. Why God couldn't have done this without me, I don't know, cause I'm tired and I'm smelly too. Why they need me to wake them up to the dire straits they were in? Why me? The people of Nineveh repented of their evil ways and saved their city. They stopped eating and great and small, young and old put on sackcloth. Even the king of Nineveh took off his robe and put on sackcloth and he sat in ashes too. The king and his nobles decreed, let every person turn back from their evil ways and from the injustice in their hands. God saw what they did, how they turned back from their evil ways, and God did not destroy Nineveh. And as for me, I'm angry at God, the compassionate. Why don't you be compassionate with me and let me be? Jonah, the reluctant and resentful prophet, was also a successful prophet. His call was heeded. Even the king put on sackcloth, the city was saved. May it be so in our day. How do we wake up and help to bring this about? Wear a piece of sackcloth, honor your pain for the world, and share the story of hope for humanity. We can wake up and repent. So I now want to come back to that, that piece that I had given us a little preview of, which is you are Jonah. Well, you are, you're, you are like Jonah. You have one line to deliver to the halls of power. And actually what's interesting is Jonah started with the people and the people put on the sackcloth and then the king responded. But what is your one line to proclaim? And I, um, in preparing for this, since I was going to ask you to think about that, I thought about that for myself too. So I'm going to share the one that came to me. Um, I actually woke up in the middle of the night last night, and, and this is what came. This is an emergency. It is not a test. This is an emergency. It is not a test. This is an emergency. It is not a test. So I put this out to you. Um, I'm thinking maybe to, to stay together in a group. Thea, what do you think? The, I agree. Um, I think we should stay together. Um, so I'm curious if anyone has has one coming through. It's it's a yeah, Thea. Well, I uh, I wrote a novel called The Swallow and the Nightingale, and as I was writing it, um, this line came to me. I don't know where it came from, but it's uh, instrumental in the book, and it's um, the line was, "Are you ready for the good?" Are you ready for the good? Are you ready for the good? Let's all try that. 
Are you ready for the good? Are you ready for the good? I think there's a lot in there about, um, you know, personal uh, enlightenment and um, community enlightenment and um, and looking to the future also for um, for peace, a peaceful future. So that's very interesting because like it's it's challenging. It gets it makes you stop and think because, well, of course, we're ready for good. Well, actually, are we <laughs> like so beautiful? Anyone else have a line? Judith says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, Judith, I'm, I'm curious, like if you are going out proclaiming this, um, are you drawn to the, the, the thy, that kind of classical language? As opposed to love your neighbor as yourself? Hmm. Judith thinks that people in positions of power would love it. Interesting. Beautiful. I love that one. Okay, Gabe, I see you unmuted. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, I was going to say I, I was trying to think of a of a line, but I don't um, I don't actually have necessarily a line. But what I do have um, that came to me in a, in a dream years ago was uh, was that uh, this concept that, um, you know, that uh, it was a whole a whole bunch of us out on a blacktop and and um, and uh, these people were trying to lead us. And they said, come, come over here, come to classroom three, come to classroom three. And um, and it took me a long time to be like, what was what is that about? You know, but I think I finally realized like we're we all are in classroom three, like the third the third planet. We all are in, in classroom three and we should be uh, students. We should be learning and we should be trying to to teach the class as well to do better. Mm, mm. Thank you, Gabe. Yeah. Ellen. I'll let Suri go first. Okay, go ahead, Suri. Um, our children will be stuck with the mess of today. Our oh, children oh. will be stuck with the mess we've made today. Mm. Our children will be stuck with the mess we've made today. But really, I was trying to remember Greta Thunberg's uh, big one-liners because she had some good ones. I think By the way, um, speaking of Greta Thunberg, there's a Haftarah that was created in our community that's also up on my website, if you, um, which is very is taking her words to the UN and putting it to Haftorah trope. Um, so that's up there as well as a resource. Um, Ellen, what what what's your line? So the lines are a little short, but the context is a little longer, if you don't mind. So um, it's kind of like a three part. New Englanders, climate crisis is happening here and now. And then I would kind of go into Montpelier, Vermont, Western Mass, Needham, Needham, Newton, Weymouth, um, Merrimack Valley, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes in Rhode Island. And so to just like wake up normally complacent New Englanders um, and the context is, is that my community of Needham had a climate catastrophic flood along with Newton and Natick on August 8th, and 230 to 250 homes were flooded. And the town declared a disaster and then did nothing about it. Oh, excuse me. And I would also add Lemonster. And so to like really bring it home, because, you know, I don't know if you remember. Rabbi Katie and some of the other folks who were around at the beginning of JCAN, you know, you started to be like, oh, well, Nantucket and the vineyard, you know, and the coastline is going away. But we didn't address the inland communities that were going to get either flooded or droughted. And mm -hmm. as much as I've been involved with this since day one, um, I did not think that my home 
and 250 other homes in my community would flood as a result of a climate catastrophic flood as soon as now. So mm -hmm. that's the context. The climate crisis is here and now. So I'm it's actually happening asking, now. Say again? The climate crisis is happening now. And I would start it with New England does, you know, like us. Like, let's look. So I'm imagining like billboards and I mean, it's just, it's an, it's just thinking about like what, like when we find our line, how do we share our line? The climate crisis is happening now in our communities. And I would, I would kind of, for me, if I was going to do the billboard, you know, I would actually list them and do a growing list, like as each one. Because then when you get up to 350 towns in Massachusetts, or let's say 340, you kind of put it into context. That's really powerful to have in a public place. The climate crisis is happening now and have different communities. It could also be a place that helps support the, the grieving that people like um, add um, and having like having a public meeting place. And that when people have a crisis, they can also come and do. Um, and I, I can suggest that people in our community are exhausted and not sleeping and so stressed out. And some of these folks are like of serious means, but if all of a sudden you now have $250,000 worth of damage in your home that is not being covered by insurance, and not being covered and helped by your community, and we got denied MEMA and FEMA funds, then all of a sudden, like, you're not in that position of, you know, wealth. And certainly me, people who are poor, we, we got totally screwed. So just wanted to put in that context. Mm. Oh. Thank Katie. Katie. These are wonderful. Um, so I... <clears throat> Words that my mother, Zikra Lebracha, spoke frequently have been on my mind and actually just wrote a whole series about this. But <clears throat> she would always say, the challenge in life is how do we turn our pain into beauty? And, and I feel like that's the challenge that we're at today. There's so much pain, but... Uh, somebody had oh your love your neighbors yourself or these other ones that are like the good now are you ready for the good you know these these ideas like how do we transform this painful situation into a beautiful situation so turning mm -hmm. the pain transforming the pain into beauty is uh, mm. the, the one that's on my mind lately so um and then I just want to share with you the if we had more time and we would have take, had a conversation about a, a second piece from Jonah that something you can contemplate over these coming days and on Yom Kippur, which is if you found yourself in the belly of the fish, three days and three nights in this fish, you're in the darkness, you can't, there's nowhere to go except to, I mean, it's finally Jonah decided to pray. What would you be praying for? Some fresh water. <laughs> so, I want to think really. Like you know, a woman who lived there. through a flood, right? <laughs> wow. Wow. Um, wow. And Ellen just really acknowledging that that just what a what a hard. What a hard thing to up and fun. But I mean, seriously, like you're in a fish and you're like, you know, like you said, it's smelly. It's there's probably the other little fish in there because I'm thinking it's really a whale, and um, and I'm thinking of the kinds of uh, like a say it in French baleen and um, kind of you know that the not their teeth, but you know whatever. But anyways, um. You know, you want to be away from the seaweed. You want to be away from the seawater. And and I'm using that as a metaphor. You know, you want to just be like breathing dry air and you want to be drinking. Clean. And so, however, that is a metaphor in life. Mm. 
Yeah, so um, thank you so much for, I'm noticing it's time to wrap up, but, but there's, you know, I really see this as the beginning of a journey. And so that invitation for you, just a reminder of some resources that were shared um, that we, the, the, the al that I encourage you to print out if you, if you're going to Yom Kippur services, you might even print out yourself a copy to, um, to, to have to be working with during silent time. Um, and to be thinking about at protests, um, doing part of the teshuva, the repentance work. Um, that that's a resource to, to bring to public spaces or even to like the beginning of a JCAN meeting. Um, and then the sackcloth and exploring whether you want to be wearing a little piece of sackcloth or, and by the way, if anybody um, wants a piece, wants me to send you a piece, um, you, you're, you're not up for going out and finding some, but you would like a piece, I'm, I'm happy you can send me an email, I'm happy to drop you one. I, um, and, um, and then the third piece is, is just really reflecting on what is your one liner? Because when we have our one liner, then um, we, like, then, then we can focus and then be creative about like, then how do we get the word out? Um, and and I and I take great as as I shared in my story I take great hope in like most prophets are going on and on and on about how horrible things are and things don't necessarily change but but Jonah actually saw a shift in the culture and so I really hold that up as um, how beautiful that that's how we close Yom Kippur the possibility of transformation on the highest levels of government so Gamar um, Chatimatova. And um, just thank you all for joining me on this journey tonight. Well, thank you so much, um, Rabbi Malka. This was just really quite amazing and wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, really appreciate this. And this was recorded. So, you know, if somebody was not able to make it, they can watch it. Um, I guess we, we're just going to do a little short commercial interlude here for JCAN, um, our resiliency team. The next thing we have on the... Uh, agenda probably coming up uh, I would guess in early November it's not scheduled yet but watch for it um, we're going to be showing the uh, babushkas of Chernobyl which is a, a story of the dead the radioactive dead zone surrounding sh uh, the Ch Chernobyl um, reactor that exploded a defiant community of women who are just refused to leave um, their husbands have died off by now, but they're still scratching out their existence on the most toxic land on earth. So a real story about resilience. So, um, and there are other events coming up. Thea, do you want to mention what else is coming up? Uh, uh, well, I'll be uh, starting to teach a six week class, a writing class called um, Dig Deep, something into the climate change uh, because people don't change their minds by listening to science. So I teach people how to tell really compelling stories. And um, that's going to be starting November 1st. Everything is on the uh, JCAN website. You could learn learn about that under classes. Yeah, right. That's our other thing that's coming up. So I'm so excited about that. So, And I'm sure we're going to have more uh, decarbonizing uh, webs webinars and... Um, De divestment webinars. So that's all there. It's all going to be on the website. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Can I mention something? Yeah, Ellen, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to mention something I'm going to be starting up as a mutual aid um, climate group to help each other through, you know, the crises. But also, this coming week is Climate Prep Week. And um, a lot of local libraries are getting together and sponsoring like Zoom online things about climate prep. Um, and if you go to like Newton and made it, there's Bacon Library and, and there's a few, I think Dedham is doing something. So like, look, and a lot of them, like, even if that's not your library, they're all like a network with each other and you can like sign up and be part of it. Some of it is writing. Some of it is 
you know, coalescing and, and, and whatnot. So I just wanted to mention that's right I think this coming week. But yeah, the crew, the community is responding to is, is the organization that sponsors that. Yes. 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 And I think it's I, in other parts of the country too. So yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. 350 Mass is hosting a climate cafe, helping us honor the pain, but not fall into despair. That is definitely something we need to be doing. And this was really helpful for this. This is really great. So thank you again and wishing everyone a meaningful Yom Kippur. And my favorite little teaching about Yom Kippur is that when do we begin to repent uh, for, you know, for Yom Kippur? And, you know, one says, oh, the beginning of Elul, or oh, the beginning of the 10 days of, you know, 10 days of awe and the final word is no. As soon as we blow the shofar on Yom Kippur, at the end of Yom Kippur, we start repenting. Um, we start preparing for the next one and repenting for it. So this is like a, I, it's a, it's a, it's, it's our, our life all the time. We need to deal with this. And so this al hate. I love the idea of this al hate not just being on Yom Kippur, but, but throughout the year and getting us used to language of acknowledging our wrongs. So and I'll, thank you again. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to put on this song that we started with um, wonderful young musician, Rena Branson, called Our Power. That's okay, thank you. And good night, everyone. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Shana Tova. Thank you. Under